Hello, welcome to the Fantastic Fiction and KGB Reading Series. Fantastic Fiction is a monthly speculative fiction reading series held on the third Wednesday of every month, hosted by Ellen Datlow and me, Matthew Kressel. We spotlight well-known and up-and-coming science fiction, fantasy, and horror authors, and admission is always free. We publish a monthly podcast and video so people who can't attend the in-person event can still enjoy the readings. If you'd like to support the series, you can donate at kgbfantasticfiction.org slash support. Anyway, on to the show. Let me get started. How is everyone doing this evening? All right. My name is Matt Kressel. I co-host this series, Fantastic Fiction at KGB, with Ellen Datlow. We are on the second Wednesday of every month, and it is always free. All we ask is that you buy a drink, hard or soft, and support the bar. So please, buy a drink. Mary is working hard to keep you hydrated. Let's, let's everyone give an applause to Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, so, Yes, Fantastic Fiction at KGB has been going for a long time. Oh man, since the late 90s, so we're, it's like it's over two decades, and we, we uh, yeah, we really appreciate like uh, everyone, all, you know, all of you, just thank you for, for coming and supporting the series through the pandemic and afterwards, and, and uh, I usually do like the upcoming readers, but I want to. I don't want to steal Ellen's let thunder. I'm gonna let Ellen do something. So, uh, I will just say, if you want to subscribe to our mailing list, go to kgbfantasticfiction.org and uh, sign up. There's a link there. We we don't spam. We send like two or three emails a month, just reminding you of uh, of the reading. So our our readers tonight are Daryl Bailey and Nathan Balinger. Very excited. To be here. Thank you. Uh, our first reader tonight is going to be Dale Bailey. Dale is the author of This Island Earth, eight features from the drive-in, and eight previous books, including In the Nightwood and The End of the End of Everything. His story, Death and Suffrage, was adapted for Showtime's Master, Masters of Horror television series. He has won the Shirley Jackson Award and the International Horror Guild Award and has been a finalist for the World Fantasy Award, Nebula Award, Locus Award, and Bram Stoker Awards. Holy shit, that's great. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, that's amazing. He lives in North Carolina with his family. Here's Dale Bailey. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm gonna hand this back so I don't accidentally oh, read Nathan's introduction. Um, <laughs> I'm a little busted up, and uh, my family is right there, and it's her fault. Um, I fell off a moving truck while I was moving her. And then while I was trying to give her directions to the reading, uh, I fell again on the escalator. So don't check your text while on the escalator. That's a, that's a little lesson. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I have a new book coming from PS Publishing. It's a collection of short stories. Uh, they're, they're conceptually linked. Uh, I'll say a brief word about the concept before I read. In 20, 10 years ago, in 2013, uh, I wrote a story about the creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, which I called the creature from the Black Lagoon recants. Uh, I published it in Clark's World, and Neil Clark wisely made me change the title <laughs> to The Creature Recants. Uh, in the collection, it's going to be called Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, what the collection is, is an attempt to take the worst, cheesiest titles from the worst, cheesiest science fiction movies of the 1950s and treat them with, thank you, with uh, some emotional seriousness, if that makes sense. Uh, to take their concepts literally, but to, treat them, um, but, but to treat them in a way that is more than cheesy. Uh, 
sort of 50s horror movies. Um, so the one I am going to read is the first story in the book. It's called I Married a Monster from Outer Space. I'm going to read the first quarter of the story. Last night, uh, Ellen told me that everything could be cut. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Uh, so I, I read it this morning, and it was 47 minutes long, uh, so I spent the day cutting it. If I go long, shout me down. Uh, it's called I Married a Monster from Outer Space, and the rule is you must take the conceit in the title literally, and you must treat it with uh, emotional seriousness. Uh, so this is called I Married a Monster from Outer Space. The tagline of the original movie is The Bride War Terror. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it begins this way. Third shift, three in the morning. Even the Walmart in Crittenden, Pennsylvania is quiet. Just the soothing hum of the buffer over in grocery and a few zombies cruising the aisles looking for something they'll never find. Margot is busy at the customer service counter, so I'm alone in my chute, stealing a chance to lounge against my register. And here comes this alien rolling down the alley that runs between housewares and hardware. First thing I think is, it's the best Halloween costume I've ever seen. It's just turned October, after all, and the hot spot front and center of the store is packed with skull-shaped candles and plastic witch's cauldrons and cheap Halloween costumes. I, I reckon there's got to be an alien costume in the mix but it's hard to believe the alien's actually wearing one of them. Sure, his silvery foil jumpsuit looks the part, but he has these giant pincers for hands and his head. Well, if it's a mask, it's the best mask I've ever seen. Imagine a colossal Brussels sprout. <laughs> Only the Brussels sprout is really an exposed brain surmounting these black goggle eyes that give absolutely nothing away. He doesn't have a nose, just a pair of slits beneath those googly eyes, and his mouth is a thin, lipless scar. Plus, he's seven feet tall if he's an inch. What I'm trying to say is that he was an alien. And after that first fleeting thought, there was never any doubt about it in my mind. He was clutching this blue Walmart. Here, Nathan. <laughs> Shopping basket in those pinchers, too. Thank you. Me? I didn't bat an eye. If there's one thing you come to appreciate working the third shift at Walmart, it's just how inconceivably weird the world can be. I've had a guy dressed like the Pope come through my lane. He, he was buying Marlboro lights. And I've had Elvis, too, a 12-pack of condoms and a bag of Tangelos. So when the alien glides into my lane, it's not like I'm unprepared, nor am I surprised by all the weird stuff he's piled into his basket. A box of tampons, a sewing kit, and a crescent wrench the size of a baseball bat. A can of Fix-A-Flat, which Donnie says never to use, but more about Donnie later. And a Blu-ray disc from the bargain bin in electronics. And there I am with my blue vest and my name tag that says Ruth. And this seven foot alien standing in front of me, I say, find everything okay? And start dragging his selections across the scanner and slipping them into the bags on the whirly gig at the end of my lane. The alien doesn't say anything at all. I don't take that to heart. To most people, a Walmart clerk just fades into the background. And that's how I felt most days. Ruth Sheldon, the invisible woman. Sometimes even Donnie, sweet as he could be, made me feel that way. Like his eyes were just 
sliding right past me. That's what I'm thinking as I drag old Bug Eye's last purchase across the scanner. That's sixty-one ninety-three, I say, smiling. And the whole time I can feel Margot's eyes drilling into the back of my head like twin laser beams. It's not the alien either. It's me she's looking at. Last week my register came up seven dollars short, which precipitated a sit down with the shift manager. No, I didn't steal it, if that's what you're thinking. You try running a few hundred transactions every night and see if you don't make a mistake or two counting back change. I'm sure Margot had her own sit down with management, which is a roundabout way of saying that as this is all going down, I'm barely paying attention to the big galoot standing in my lane. And all the time, Margot's making my skull smoke with those laser beams of hers. So when Bug Eyes just stands there, I'm not a happy camper. Forget your wallet, I say. Bug Eyes just stands there. I'm sorry, sir, says Margo, who has somehow closed the distance between the customer service counter and my chute at the speed of light. We'll have to void your order. So that's what I have to do. Drag each item out of its bag, scan it, and dump it back into his empty basket. The whole time, the two of them stand there, staring at me. Margo with this thin-lipped sneer and the alien with no expression that you can discern. Who knows what he's thinking? He's an alien. But in that moment, I could have clawed that smug expression right off Margo's face and peed on Sam Walton's grave. It wasn't too long ago that I'd come up short at the grocery store and had to look on as the cashier fished stuff out of my bags and voided them one by one until we got down to what I could afford, which was exactly $57.30. I ask you, is it too much to ask to have a pint of Ben and Jerry's Boom Chocolata once in a while? The whole thing was humiliating. So I feel some sympathy or empathy or whatever's the right word for old pincers here. Which is why what happened after my shift happened at all, I suppose. The alien, it walks out of the Walmart and into the night. Four hours later, I punch out and follow it, zipping through the sliding doors into a morning so beautiful that I almost forgot how much my feet hurt and how tired I felt. The sky was all streaky with different shades of pearl and gray. And low in the east, just where the sun was breaking, it looked like some careless artist had smeared these swaths of red and orange and gold and half a dozen other colors I didn't have a name for. It almost took my breath away. I stood there and took it all in, letting the rays of light shooting over the Hooters burn Walmart right off my skin. Then I noticed all the buggies that people had left standing in the lot and the spindly trees that looked so sad standing there on their little islands and the discarded Coke bottles and the crushed beer cans and this pile of cigarette butts where someone had dumped their ashtray. I even saw a seeping diaper lying right there in the blacktop where someone had changed their baby in the back seat. I turned away from it all and trudged toward my car. It wasn't much to look at, that car. It was a sun-blasted old 88, but it ran like a tick. When it comes to engines, Donnie's a genius with his hands. So I slid in, started her up, and swung the wheel toward the highway, and that's when I saw the alien. It was sitting on a curb under one of those spindly trees. Thank you. It had its head between its knees and six or seven of those crushed beer cans from the lot between its feet. It must have been sucking out the backwash. And I could have sworn it was eating year-old mulch. I've never quite figured out 
why I did what I did next. But what I think is that it all came crashing down on me, the sneer on Margot's face as she watched me unwind the alien's order and the bitter taste in my mouth when that grocery store clunk ran my own boon chocolata backward over her scanner. I think it was those rays of light like you see in Bible pictures, shooting over the hooters and lighting up acres of gray pavement littered with stuff people didn't want anymore. Maybe it was the Hooters itself, where I could have gotten a job even if I didn't have a diploma, only I don't look anything like a Hooters girl and can't lean over and push my boob up against Donnie's shoulder when I deliver a fresh pitcher of Coors Light. So what I did was cut across the lot and break right there in front of the alien. I wound down the window and said, come on and get in if you want to. The alien climbed to its feet, pincered open the door, and folded itself into the passenger seat. It had to bend its head to keep its brain from rubbing the tattered upholstery of the roof, and it smelled like stale beer and dead mulch. It said something in a language like no language I'd ever heard before. Its voice sounded like a locust trapped in a jar. I pretended I understood it. I don't know where we're going, I said, but where we went was home. About halfway there, it occurs to me that it's a pretty dumb thing I've done, picking up an alien. I'm not even sure what planet it's from, for one thing, and for another, I don't have the first clue about its intentions and whether they're honorable. Just don't get any ideas in your head, okay? I say to the alien. Though given the size of that brain, I reckon it must be all over ideas. It buzzes at me, and I pretend I know what it's saying. Thanks for the ride, it says. And I say, you're welcome. I feel a little better after that. It's always chancy picking up someone you don't know. And I wonder why I've risked it in the first place. Except, I don't really wonder. Not really. You don't have to be Sigmund Freud to figure it out. It started with scrap. Every morning I drove home from work, I see this mutt tied up outside this rotting trailer. Half the time it had flipped over its water bowl. The other half, it didn't have a water bowl in the first place. I figured it must be nearly dead with thirst. So one day I pull over and march up the stairs of that old mobile home and start hammering on the door. You pound on the door of a trailer. It's nothing but flimsy metal. You make a lot of noise. So I've barely gotten started when there's suddenly this wiry, shirtless guy with washboard abs standing in front of me. This is what I'm thinking about as I make the turn onto Zion Road with Brainiac from Planet X here in tow. I'm thinking about this boy who can't be more than 19 years old with a scraggly beard and hair like Jesus. He props himself in the doorway, a joint smoldering between his fingers, and he says, well, I'm up. What do you want? I want that dog, I said. And he just looks at me like he didn't even know he had a dog. Then I hear this girl from inside the trailer. Her voice is good looking, the way a DJ's voice is good looking. You know how you can just see them inside your head? What do they want, Aaron? Aaron takes a hit off the joint, exhales, and sucks the smoke back up through his nostrils. She wants a dog. And give her the fucking dog and come back to bed. Aaron shrugs. You heard her. Take the fucking dog. So that's what I do. When I showed up back home with it lolling out the window, Donnie says, You're going to get a shot, Ruth. Stealing people's dogs. And I say, They don't care about that dog. And I guess I'm right. Because the boy with the Jesus hair and his girlfriend with the good looking voice. Never have shown up to claim it. After that, 
I'm all over animals. I make Donnie stop the truck so I can move turtles out of the road. And when someone drops a couple of kittens in the woods across from our trailer, I take them in too. Thing one and thing two, Donnie dubbed the kittens. So it's Scrap that greets us the morning I bring the alien home. He comes tearing out from under the trailer, yapping his head off the minute we pull into the driveway. I reckon that he'll calm down once he gets a chance to snuff my hands. But I forget about the alien climbing out of the passenger seat. Thunk! Goes the alien's door. The dog falls silent for a second. And then he rips into another tirade. I'm starting to get him settled down when the door opens. And there's Donnie in sweats and a wife beater, leaning against the doorway of our trailer in the exact same position as the boy with Jesus' hair. Only Donnie's hair is a lank, no-color brown, and he doesn't have washboard abs. Donnie's built more like the Pillsbury Doughboy, and he's yawning and scratching lazily at his big, soft belly as he watches us. When Scrap finally calms down enough for him to get a word in edgewise, he says, You've really outdone yourself this time, Ruth. Klaatu barada nikto. That's what Donnie ends up saying to the alien, and the alien chirps something back at him. Donnie grins this big loony grin, and I feel something break inside me for this sad, stupid man and the situation we've gotten ourselves into. We're barely old enough to drink, and we've already acquired one dead baby, one dog, two cats, an alien, more in the way of medical bills than we can ever hope to pay, and grief enough to last two people a lifetime. We live in a fire trap of a rental trailer and work crap jobs. And a big night on the town is 20 wings and two pictures of Coors Light at Hooters, after which Donnie fucks me in as many ways as he can think of, which is a lot, in a room as dark as he can make it. And here he is spitting gobbledygook at our alien who was spitting it right back at him. I love him a little bit, I guess. And I vow that I will love him even more, or try, as he waves us inside. Which is hardly fit for company. Hurricane Donnie is blown right through the place. Six empty cans of Milwaukee's Best on the coffee table, a bag of Doritos on the sofa, and the conchuling remains of a TV dinner, presently being investigated by Thing One on the counter. Thing two, meanwhile, is clawing at the sofa, and Scrap, who has followed us inside, has his front paws on the alien's thigh and is rooting around in its crotch. <laughs> this is my house, and this is my husband, slipping out a morning fart, his face tattooed with lines from the sheets. Donnie says, why don't you rustle us up some grub, Ruth? I'm going to go shower for work. And just like that, we slip into our morning routine, and I have the same thought I always have, which is, why bother showering in the first place? Donnie works in the pit at the quickie lube, staring up at the underside of one car after another for eight hours straight. By the time he comes home, he'll be filthy. Black gunk caked under his nails and in his hair. It's a waste of his talents. I tell the alien, muting the TV. I sweep up the beer cans and dump them into the trash, ditto the Doritos bag and the TV dinner, much to the distress of thing one. I set the coffee going and stir up some eggs. The alien sits down on the sagging sofa, buzzing its locust buzz. I pretend I know what it says. He's a genius with his hands, at least weighs around an engine. Give him a day or two with a clunker and he'll have it running like a tick. If he had his certificate, he could be pulling down $18 an hour, easy. But he dropped out of school to take care of me. My dad 
put me out as soon as he knew I was pregnant. An interrogative buzz. He's supposed to be studying for his GED. Emphasis on supposed to be. What Donnie does with his off hours is mostly watch movies and guzzle beer. But before I can go on, Donnie comes scooting out of the bedroom in his clean coveralls. I slap down a plate of scrambled eggs and a cup of Maxwell House for him. Same deal with the alien, right there on the beat up coffee table. Donnie starts wolfing it down like he's starving to death. All the alien does is look at me. Donnie says, if it ain't gonna eat, I'll take it. That's when I remember. I head outside with a plate. When I get back, Donnie has helped himself to the alien's eggs. Gort here didn't seem to mind, Donnie says. Gort? Well, we gotta call him something. What you got there, Ruth? What have got is a plate of old mulch from last spring when I insisted Donnie tried to dress the place up a bit. And what I do is set it down in front of the alien. Gort. I open a can of Milwaukee's best and Gort digs in. Donnie whistles. At least he's going to be cheap to feed. What is it you plan to do with him, Ruth? Put him up for a while, I suppose. You can't just keep an alien, Ruth. It's not like he's a dog. I didn't say I was keeping him. I said I was putting him up. Why don't you listen for once? And then, you want to go up to Hooters Saturday night? I'm off. Donnie's stumped. He knows he wants to go to Hooters, but we can't really afford it. This is just about my only card, and I don't play it often. But sometimes you do what you have to do. Finally, Donnie says, well, I guess it couldn't hurt to put him up a little while. Long as he eats mulch, I guess we can afford to feed him. Thank you, Donnie, I say, and I kiss him on the crown of his head. He just shrugs. I better get moving or I'm going to be late for work. Have a good day, I said. But how you could have a good day in the pit of a quickie lube, I do not know. I don't say this to Donnie, of course. I just endure his coffee breath when he leans over to kiss me and watch him out the door. A moment later, his F-150 rumbles to life. In the silence that follows, I put my elbow on the counter, pop my chin on the hill of my hand, and gaze at the alien. I guess it's just you and me now, Gord, I say. Sometimes, I think that was at the bottom of all the trouble that followed. Donnie giving the alien a name. Once a thing has a name, it starts to acquire other things you might not want it to have. Gort was clearly a boy's name, for instance. So the alien acquired a sex. It's not like we ever actually had him sexed. You understand the way we'd had thing one and thing two, sex with the vet. It's just that with a name like Gort, you never check the little F box on those forms you fill out at the urgent care. And that's just the start of it. Before you knew it, Gort had his own place at the table and his own spot in front of the TV and his own square of the countertop to keep his Tupperware containers of mulch. But I guess I'm getting ahead of myself because none of that had happened yet. All I'm saying is, you give a thing a name, it'll take everything you ever had if you're not careful. That's it. Thank you. The story goes on for a bit, and um, yeah. 
I hope you'll buy the book and see what, ha what happens. Uh, PS Publishing, you may have a smartphone, a smart device of some sort. You could go order it while you're waiting for Nathan to read. <laughs> Which reading, I assure you, will be spectacular. Uh, thank you all so much. We're going to take about a 10 minute break, so have a drink while you're waiting, and uh, we'll be back soon. Hello there. Hi there. Welcome back to the. Hello, welcome back. Hello. We're going to start soon. Um, over the next few months. Shh. Quiet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, quiet. Actually, um, I'm going to tell a little story. When I was in, where was I? In uh, Australia. I, 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 I know a little bit of German, but not much. I mean, I went to Germany, and I kind of got tutored in it. So I can't, I don't know the grammar, but I got enough to get along. <coughs> and in um, Cooper Pedy is a, an opal mine town in Australia, the middle of Australia, in the outback. And you, they have hotel, the hotel, the hostel, is in an, op an abandoned opal mine. And, but the walls are like really thin. So you got all these, you know, it's a hostel, it's a youth hostel kind of. And I was there with a friend and next door the people, they weren't really loud, but they were like chattering and chattering in, in German. And I was finally said, Robita, I yelled at them. Only I was like, silence please. And they immediately <laughs> shut up. <laughs> so Robita. <laughs> That's about all I remember in German. Anyway, our, um, we have a really good group of people who are gonna be reading over the next few months. July 12th, we have Michael Sisko and Farah Rose Smith. <laughs> August 9th, we have uh, C.S.E. Cooney and Steve Berman. <laughs> September 13th, Benjamin Percy and Josh Roundtree. October 11th, Livia Llewellyn and, and Robert Levy. <laughs> and I hope you'll all come down and give them a, a big hand. And November 8th, Cadwell Turnbull and Victor Manibo. And that's the end so I think in December, it's Holly Black and someone else. So, December, yeah. yeah, December. And TK, the usual. Yeah, yeah to come. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to welcome Nathan Ballingrad, who's the author of The Strange Wounds, Six Stories from the Border of Hell, and North American Lake Monsters, which won the Shirley Jackson Award, a novella, Crypt of the Moon Spider, I mean, we didn't put the the, thank God. We, we kept putting the the in there, and there is no the. So I had to make sure it was like gone from any kind of PR or anything else. It's just Crypt of the Moon Spider. <coughs> it will appear in 2024 from Tour.com's novella series. <coughs> he has been shortlisted for the World Fantasy Award, British Fantasy Award, and Bram Stoker Award. His stories have been adapted into the Hulu series Monsterland, and he lives in Asheville, North Carolina. Please welcome Nathan Ballinger. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, this novel, The Strange, just came out a couple of months ago. Uh, it's a little bit of a departure for me in that it's not, you know, a traditional. It's not strictly a horror story like I'm more well known for. Uh, this is a story that takes place on Mars in 1930. Uh, it's a lot of influence from uh, Bradbury and from westerns, and. Um, it is a story about a 14-year-old girl who uh, has something taken from her and decides to go get it uh, with some, go get it back with some people she kind of dragoons into accompanying her. Uh, I'm gonna read a portion from uh, about a third of the way into the book and I think all you really need to know, well, the only context you really need is that she has, she has started her journey. Uh, she is being pursued by a couple of miners who, uh, with whom she had a run in in the diner, she and her father, and uh, and and uh, one of the miners was killed in an accident, and so this guy's friends are are, are looking for her. She's in a she's in a town called a mining community called Digtown, and uh, it is night and it is getting very cold and she is a little frightened. Looking around, I realized that I didn't know where I was. Stupid to get lost in such a small community. 
for the streets made no damn sense. I backtracked along the road I was sure I'd been on, but nothing looked right. Each road kept branching into smaller tributary paths or joining larger ones until I couldn't even tell which direction I was headed. I had the notion that the shack was a kind of trickster, wicking out of sight as soon as I rounded a corner, only to appear again behind me. I turned around in the middle of a frozen street, the misty snow falling around me more heavily as the temperature continued to drop. I was wearing a coat, but the heavy gear and the heat tents were with Joe. Fear crawled up the back of my neck. It seemed absurd that I might freeze to death in the middle of Digtown, standing in a street surrounded by shuttered buildings, but suddenly the possibility pushed every other thought from my head. A figure emerged from the snowy veil, then another behind it. Two men, their eyes shining that pale underleaf green. They wore rough work clothes, the sleeves bunched over their elbows, nothing to protect them from the night. They should have been paralyzed by cold, but they seemed as comfortable as though it were midday. One of them had an arm in a sling. My stomach dropped. He said, well, ask the girl from the diner. I told you. I turned away from them and started walking. Hey girl, hold on a minute. I picked up my pace. I'd forgotten the chill. A flush of fear coursed through me. I had nowhere to go. Their footsteps crunched through the ice behind me. I said, stop. I ran. I used Dick Town's chaotic layout to my advantage. They knew the town better than I did, of course, but the narrow lanes were so tightly packed that I was able to turn corners faster than they could follow. A weird sound bounced along the walls after me, a mixture of keening and something guttural, something despairing and broken, like an old language articulated by the wrong tongue, a language of monsters. It chilled me and I ran harder. I had doubled back on myself enough that the tracks were confused, the first thing that saved me that night. In a few moments, I was huddled against the side of a small wooden house, doing my best to quiet my breathing, while I heard the men crunch through the crust of ice, trying to find me. I couldn't tell how close they were, but their eerie sounds seemed to come from everywhere. And then, the second thing, the, the second thing that saved me, a woman, tall and angular, emerging from an alley and beckoning to me. Widow Kessler. Without thinking, I dashed over to her, the echoes of my own footsteps skittering through the dense little neighborhood. Nothing I could do about that. She grabbed my arm in a vice and hauled me quickly behind her. <clears throat> Snow gusted around us as the wind kicked up, and it seemed to me that we were running through a drift of falling stars. I cast a glance at her face, stern and gaunt, creviced like old rock only barely lit by the ambient light in this drowsing, haunted town. Almost since I had known her, she'd only been little more than a figure of sorrow, wearing black and mourning for her dead husband, still answering to a name that defined her by his absence. It seemed pathetic to me sometimes, the way she surrendered her full claim to personhood, accepting her new life as a dead man's shadow. To see her now, a flare of purpose and hard motion, was to see someone altogether new. She was the first adult I had seen act with something other than derangement in a long time. Caught in the fog of my own terror, I followed her gratefully. Though most homes were empty, occasional windows shed little blooms of light. We passed them quickly. I could still hear the footsteps behind us, and now I heard one of the men call out, but they sounded farther away than before. I sensed people stirring around me. A curtain was pulled aside, and a face appeared in a window. I kept my gaze to the ground, following the widow's dirt-scuffed shoes. Fear clutched my bones, and I could sense it in her, too. In here, child. A door opened from darkness into darkness, and we stepped through it. She shut it behind us. After a brief rustling, a match flared, and the smell of sulfur filled my nose. The widow Kessler touched the match to a lantern, and light flourished, revealing a small, cozy, home hung with draperies and decorated with a mixture of standard issue furniture that came along with the haves and personal items. The kind the only rich could afford. Only the rich could afford. I was reminded that she was the nominal manager of the mine and had once been considered part of the Mar rising Martian aristocracy. I, wonder why, I wondered why she chose to live here in Digtown, shutting the comforts she could surely afford in New Galveston my mother once observed that following her husband's death, Widow Kessler had chosen to move into her own grave and to live there until she was ready to lie in it permanently. 
There was only one room here, but a large curtain was bunched in the corner to section off a place for privacy. A simple cot was propped there, along with a small chest, open to reveal folded clothes of humble design. Although there was less space here than in the Habs in New Galveston, it felt larger and less cluttered, more like a home. She stood there for a moment, looking at me with stern bewilderment, as, I, as if I had intruded into her home unannounced and unwelcome, and she had not dragged me here herself. What shall I do with her, she said. She was clearly speaking to herself, or perhaps to the dead husband she chained to, her, she chained to herself like a dragged weight. An answer was not expected from me. I thought of my father's lonely conversations with my mother and wondered if this was something that happened to all adults who found themselves suddenly bereft of love. It did not seem such a terrible thing. If all one had was a ghost to talk to, well, one might as well embrace it. She turned away from me and went to a small range. Do you like tea? I nodded, but her back was to me. Yes, ma'am, I said after a moment. I'll make you some tea. There was a small table nearby with two chairs. I thought, perhaps cruelly, the two chairs were an extravagance for a widow. I took one of them. What are you doing in Digtown, she said. I'm getting treads for Watson. She poured her measure of water from a large clay jug into a kettle and set it on the range, which I noticed was already glowing with heat. It took the range in our own hab a good five minutes to get that hot. Another reminder that she had not surrendered all the privileges of her station. I recalled the searching questions of the miner that night. How much longer until all of this runs out? And wondered if she'd known all along that something like this might happen. A dangerous luxury, perhaps, to keep these items in dig town. Did you realize, do you realize coming here might get you killed? That's because everyone in Digtown is crazy. She turned to face me finally. Is that what you think? That's what everyone thinks. She gave me her back again and busied herself with preparing the tea. I became preoccupied with a lantern and the light that spilled through the curtains. Would those men come here? Mr. Wickham said most folks have gone into the mine. Is that true? It is, she said, though not everyone just yet. You still need to be wary. This migration into the dark disturbed me. It was cold enough up here. How much worse in the places the sunlight had never reached. Why, I asked. She poured boiling water into mugs and brought them to the table. She took the other chair, and for a moment, we might have looked like a sort of family. The gardens are calling them down, she said at last. Sooner or later, the whole town will be gone. Best thing you can do is go back home and wait it out. Won't be anyone left here to hold a grudge eventually. A whole community moving prematurely into their own graves, just like Widow Kessler. What gardens? I recalled the mushroom farm she was said to have growing in the cellar. It occurred to me that the isolation and grief might have, been de might have deranged her thinking in more ways, in ways not immediately obvious. When she didn't answer, I said, are you going into the mine too? Not yet, I have business here first, all in due time. She watched me while I sipped my tea. It was wonderfully hot with notes of lemon and ginger I closed my eyes and felt it fill my chest with heat. I felt suddenly exhausted. My life had been thoroughly dismantled over the past couple of days, and right now all I wanted to do was sleep in this safe, warm place. Widow Kessler seemed to sense it. Stay the night, Belle. Don't go outside until morning, and when you do, go straight home. I can't go home. I have business, too. Here? Yes, and then more out there with Silas Munt and whoever runs with him. She didn't receive the information gladly, but at least she didn't try to argue with me anymore. She seemed only sad, as though she had realized that whatever fate was closing in on us all could not be avoided, despite her every wish and effort. It made me sad too, and I wondered if, it was, if I was just like her, only so much younger, and if all my energies were being wasted. A voice carried in through the window, the injured miner, Charlie, still hunting for me. I was chilled by it. His persistence indicated a derangement stronger than I had suspected. Widow Kessler rose from the table and went into the curtained alcove. She pulled the cot away from the wall. Its legs made a dull noise against the packed earth. 
A small rug was laid beneath where the cot had been. She bent slowly to her knees and rolled it up. A trap door was there with a small recess on one side so you could lift it open. What are you doing? They might come here, she said. You should hide. I felt cold. Does that lead to the mines? Was she giving me over to them after all? It's just my cellar. You'll be safe. Stay in the main chamber. There are two smaller rooms and you should stay out of them. Fear welled up inside me, almost overwhelming me, overwhelming me completely. I don't understand. Why are they chasing me? I didn't do anything. They attacked us. I heard my voice crack. I put my hands over my face because I couldn't bear for her to see how stupid and scared I felt. They robbed our diner. Why did they do that? Why does everyone hate us? The widow sat opposite me again. Because you have things, Annabelle. That man was asking you about coffee that night. Do you remember? I took my hands from my face. This is about coffee? That's insane. It's not just coffee. It's food. It's eggs and bread and cigarettes and water. It's orange juice. It's milk that comes from cows raised on earth-grown grass. It's spare cylinders for the engines. It's oil. It's gasoline. We don't even have all those things. And what we do have, we have to buy. It isn't free for us. It's not fair. No, but we're Martians now, Annabelle. Fair isn't a word we use anymore. The people in Digtown have been abandoned by New Galveston. The miners are left to breathe in more and more of the mineral, and they're treated like something less than human. Don't let them hear you use the word fair. She went back to the trap door and pulled it open in a silent yawn. Trails of loose dirt spilled into the opening. It's time. I stared at the hole in the earth. It seemed to breathe out cold air, a blowing silence into the room. Going down there seemed impossible. Every cell in my body recoiled from it. I considered going outside, trying once again to find my way back to Joe Riley and to Sally, but that seemed impossible too. Widow Kessler stood behind the hole, one half of her face cast in the wild light of the lantern, the other a dark mystery. She was a creature of dignity and threat, heavy with supernatural judgment. Go on, she said. Her voice had an edge to it. I approached the cellar with reluctance. As I came to its lip, I saw a ladder built into the wall. I could not see the bottom. I looked at the widow's face, but she was already looking behind me at the door. I turned, a quick pulse of fear surging through me but the door was still closed. The lantern sent shadows flickering across it. I descended the ladder into darkness and the widow closed it over my head. I heard the sound of the rug and the cot being dragged back into place. I was entombed. I don't know how, lo how long I stood there in the cold and dark. I suppose it couldn't have been long at all, but it seemed as though I'd slipped into a place measured in time on a different scale. I thought of the observation window and the Eurydice as I waited for some indication that I still belonged to a world defined by heat and light. I thought of what it must have been like for the passengers, my own parents, to stare through that window into the abyss between the worlds where time was measured by the lifetimes of suns. I felt a terror of that darkness. Martian nights are spangled with stars, draped in the sky like necklaces of light, but our and our twin moons burn like phosphorus. We only knew real darkness when the sandstorms came, and even then we had our own lights to flower into it. This darkness was absolute. I extended my hand in front of me and walked until it pressed into the packed dirt of a wall. I ran my palm across it, dislodging granules of sand. It felt cool. I considered pacing around to get the bearings of the cellar, but I remembered the widow's caution about the other rooms, and that stopped me. How big was this room? And how big were the others? It occurred to me that her cellar might extend far beyond the bottom of the widow's small home, might extend into the bowels of Mars itself. This was Digtown, after all. The thought paralyzed me, and I crouched in place, my breath coming hard and fast. Widow Kessler's voice drifted from above. I thought she was talking to herself or to her husband, husband's ghost again until I heard heavy footsteps and then two more voices. I climbed halfway up the ladder so I could hear. Thank you, ma'am, a male voice. Careful, it's hot. Hot is most welcome. Another man's voice. You seen the girl, Mrs. Kessler? What girl? 
The one from the diner in the city. She's running around here somewhere. So, I thought she might have been drawn to the light in your window. No one comes here. You know that. A silence stretched. You sure you won't take some tea yourself, Charlie? Yeah, said the second man. I guess I might. As I strained to listen, something touched my face. My whole body convulsed with fear and disgust, and I nearly fell off the ladder. And then I heard a noise coming from somewhere behind me, scraping against the dirt. It was a small sound, a tiny sound, but in this black chamber, it might as well have been a rat scratching against the interior of my own skull. I gripped the rungs of the ladder more tightly, prepared to launch myself through the trap door. To my astonishment, my teeth were grinding in rage. I did not like to be afraid, and my body reacted with fury, as if I was somehow entitled not to be scared, as if the machineries of fate had no business figuring me into their calculations. My thoughts fled to my pulp stories. I imagined the wicked princesses of Ryder Haggard and wished to be one of them. I would transfigure myself into a devouring flame, a princess of hell, expanding until I took the cellar and the widow and all of Digtown into my burning belly, and then I would grow further still until all of Mars was a lifeless cinder. More touches landed on my face, brushing it like tiny fingers. Something landed in my hair, and I heard the vibration of an insect's wings. I shuddered, feeling revulsion, but at least this was something mundane, something of the known world. And then I heard a noise, small, barely there at all. It sounded like a scraping footstep. A voice whispered, Agatha? I whimpered. It was a man's voice, gravelly, grave-colored. This was not Haggard. This was Hoffman or Poe. It said, who's there? Still, I stayed quiet. Is this heaven? The question frightened me even more than the circumstance. Anyone who would ask it must be mad. Madness unsettled me more than anything else. Mars seemed to draw it out of people, setting fire to some lonely region of the brain and filling their heads with its acrid smoke. I could almost smell it. I didn't respond. The cellar was filled with an unearthly silence. I couldn't even hear the people above speaking anymore. Had they heard the voice, too? Were they crouched above me, ears pressed to the floor, eyes wide like green lamps? After an extended silence, I crept down from the ladder and stepped quietly onto the dirt floor. I moved forward a couple of steps, arms extended in front of me so I wouldn't walk into anything or anyone. Hello, I whispered. No response. I trailed my fingers along the wall and walked farther, terrified yet unwilling to stay passive for whatever was down here. The wall came to an abrupt end, and I felt a subtle drop in air temperature. I was at the threshold to one of the rooms Widow Kessler had told me to avoid. Cautiously, I stepped into the archway. I had been in absolute darkness long enough that an illumination I would not, that I would have been blind to in any other context stood out like moonlight. Far from where I stood, too far to be part of the cellar, was a faint green luminescence the same light shade found in the eyes of the dig downers. It backlit what looked like a large pile of black stones strewn over the floor between it and where I stood. I stepped inside, moving closer. I attempted to step softly over the nearest rock, about as big, ar big around as a cooking pot. The bottom of my shoe brushed against it and it collapsed in a puff of dust. It was a mushroom. I remembered immediately the mushroom farm I'd heard that she grew and felt a mixture of wonder and relief. I'd always, imagined it contained in, it, I'd always imagined it was contained in a series of trays, or pots at least. These seemed to grow wild, covering the floor of a small room like a vast carpet. They led to a gaping tunnel at the far end of the room, going deeper into the ground. I stepped closer to it and peered inside. There wasn't enough illumination to make out much detail, but it was clear that the tunnel extended for some distance in a steady decline. A chill rippled across my skin. This was where the man had gone. I imagined the tunnel wending deep into the rock, into some deeper Mars, a colder Mars, where the mad lived. Frightened, I turned away and hurried across the mushroom-covered floor, headed for the cellar's main room. I tripped over something hard and went sprawling into the fungus, releasing a gamey cloud. 
Each torn fungus spilled that pastel green bioluminescence. I yanked my foot away from whatever I'd stumbled over and turned to see what it was. A skull stared back at me in the weak green light, its jaw yawning open, the mushrooms growing out of it in a thick, choking tide. The rumors came rushing back to me. Zachary Kessler, the widow's dead husband, his broken skeleton lay before me like a ruined city. And that's the end of that chapter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Nathan. This is great. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, you don't have you can hang out here and drink some more. And uh, see you next month. been listening to the Fantastic Fiction at KGB reading series. Check out our website at kgbfantasticfiction.org and click on support if you'd like to help keep the series going. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening and see you next month.